Okay, so today uh, we are going to have Lewis Coca-Cola. So it's a great pleasure uh, to have him here in the topology seminar. Uh, he is uh, uh, he is based at uh, Michigan State University, and uh, we will hear about uh, approx approximate uh, and discrete vector bundles uh, in theory and application. So let's uh, let's see. Okay, so thank you for the presentation and thank you for inviting me. So yeah, I'm gonna be discussing approximate and discrete notions of vector bundles. And so since I wasn't exactly sure who the audience was, and I think it's always good to introduce what you're gonna be talking about, I'm gonna spend some time uh, discussing the, the, re like the, the classical notion of, of vector bundle and of characteristic classes. Then I'm going to give two examples of how vector bundles seem to appear in applications. Uh, and there are many more, but uh, I have to discuss just a few of those. And then um, I'm going to discuss uh, um, recent work with Jose Perea in which we try to make sense out of those things that look like vector bundles, um, since they are like things in applications, so they are kind of noisy and incomplete. You have to kind of relax your notion of vector bundle in order to capture that. And, and then out of these uh, like approximate uh, vector bundles, can you, can you extract any topological information? Like can you compute a characteristic class or something like that? So, so let's start with, with a classical picture. And, and please interrupt me at any time if you have a question. Um, yeah, so let me remind you what a vector bundle is. So if you, you fix a rank D, which is a natural number, and you, you also fix a topological space, which is usually called the base. And now you consider uh, continuous functions from some other topological space, usually called the total space, into V. Uh, these are continuous maps. And in order for those to be, or in order for one of these to be a vector bundle of rank D, it has to satisfy a few properties. First of all, Y as a set has to be uh, in bijection or isomorphic to a disjoint union of uh, these Euclidean spaces, R to the D. Um, and R to the D is usually called the fiber. So as a set, Y is just many, many copies of the fiber and you have as many copies as there are points in B. But topologically, we're gonna want Y to be more interesting Topologically, Y can be essentially anything as long as the map is locally trivial. So to remind you what's locally trivial, well, a vector bundle is trivial if it is the product of the base and the fiber, and it, it is locally trivial if it is locally so. So in a picture, this is a vector bundle because of the following. First of all, if you fix any point in the base, you get a copy of R. So the, um, the fiber is R, the, the rank is one. And we can see that this as a set is just a disjoint union of many copies of, of the real line. Um, but it is locally, and, and it is locally trivial because if I, I can cover the base by some open sets such that when I restrict the vector bundle to those open sets, here I restricted the vector bundle to U1, for example, uh, what I get is something trivial, meaning that the total space is now a product of the base times the fiber. So that's what locally trivial means. It just means that locally, um, this, this total space is the product of the base and the fiber. And for example, a classical example of a, of a vector bundle is that of the tangent bundle of a differentiable manifold. If you have a differentiable manifold M, you can glue together all the tangent spaces and, and get a, a total space um, that, that is topologically kind of like a, a continuous um, gluing of, of all the tangent spaces. Okay, and just to fix some notation, the vector bundles over a fixed base P of rank V are gonna be denoted by vect uh, B. And these are gonna be vector bundles up to isomorphism. I didn't tell you what isomorphism of vector bundles is, but if I, 
if I give you the, the proper definition of vector bundle, if I tell you exactly what this means, um, that, that, that's easy to come up with. So, so let's just take it for, for granted. OK, so that's what a vector bundle is. Now, uh, in practice, it is very useful to know that there are other ways to present a vector bundle. And the ways we're going to be interested in are cocycles and classifying maps. So let's start with uh, reminding what a cocycle is. I see cocycles as recipes for constructing vector bundles. So I, I have the base. I have a fixed base, and I want to construct a vector bundle over it. And a cocycle is exactly what tells me how to construct the total space. So suppose that you wanted to, to construct a vector bundle. The first thing that you would do is you would cover your base by open sets. Suppose that we want to reconstruct the Mobius one. You would take your base, cover it by open sets. Then you would take the product of each open with the fiber. And now this starts looking like a vector bundle, but you're not done because you have to tell me if you, if you go to this point, for example, this point has two fibers. So you have to tell me how to glue those. You want to glue this with this, you want to glue this with this, and you want to glue this with this. And that is exactly what a cycle does. A cycle tells you how to glue these disjoint fibers that should be the same. So a cycle is, is going to be a family of maps of this form. So for each intersection of the open sets that you chose, that you covered the base with, um, in each point on the, of the intersection, you get a matrix. In this case, we are using uh, cocycles valued in the orthogonal group. You could use other groups. For us, um, we are just going to use the orthogonal group everywhere. So let's not worry about other choices. Um, and the orthogonal group can be seen as the automorphisms of um, a, a Euclidean space. So this is, this is telling me how to glue two copies of the Euclidean space. Uh, so in a picture, the idea is that, again, you have a point in intersection. You have two fibers for it. And every point should have exactly one fiber. So you should glue those in some, in some way. The cocycle um, is telling you how to do that. So for any point in intersection, the cocycle tells you how to go from one fiber to the other one with an automorphism. And so you can use that to glue the two fibers. And now you're almost done. So now you, you have these disjoint pieces, and you know how to glue them together. Um, but you have to make sure of one thing. You have to make sure that your gluings are consistent. And, and that's, ensure, that's ensured by the cocycle condition. So a cocycle is going to be a family of maps of this form that satisfies the cocycle condition. And the cocycle condition tells you the following in a picture. If you have a triple intersection, and you have a point in it, in, in the triple intersection, you're going to have now three copies of the fiber. And the cocycle tells you how to glue each pair of copies. So the cocycle tells you how to go from here to here, and how to go from here to here, and how to go from here to here. So in particular, for this to be consistent, for the gluing to make sense, you want that if you do this, you get the same thing as doing this. And that's precisely what the cocycle condition uh, guarantees. So again, a cocycle is just a family of maps defined on the intersection um, that you should interpret as a rule for gluing uh, local pieces that satisfy the cocycle condition. And we're going to denote cocycles uh, by Z1. And these are usually called like check cocycles because there, there are other notions of cocycle. Um, these are check cocycles subordinate to you with values in the orthogonal group. Um, OK. So, so far, what we saw is the following. We know essentially what a vector bundle is. And I told you that I gave you this notion of cocycle. <clears throat> and the construction that we outlined in the previous slide is this arrow here. It takes a cocycle, and what it does is first, it takes each open in the cover and takes a product with a fiber, and then, then takes a disjoint union of all of those. Those were the, the three pieces of the Mobius band. And then it uses the cocycle to glue those pieces together. So this is, this is a total space of the, of the vector bundle. 
and this is this arrow is telling you how to give an echo cycle, do this gluing, and get the total space. And the cycle condition is ensuring that this is a well-defined uh, equivalence relation. Okay, so now one question is, well, are these two things the same? Is, is a vector bundle the same thing as giving a cycle? And the answer is almost. Um, you have to do a few things. First, you have to realize that if you did a change of basis in all of the fibers at the same time, you would be getting the same vector bundle up to isomorphism. So you have to take a quotient of the set of cocycles by some notion of fiber-wise change of basis. That's a bit informal, but it's not going to be super important for us what exactly it means. Just there is some uh, like simple equivalence relation on this set that you can take a quotient by and get um, this check cohomology group. Uh, sorry, check cohomology set. This is just a set. Um, and now you have to do one more thing. So. Um, not every vector bundle is going to trivialize on a fixed open cover. So you may, you have to let me change the open cover. You have to let me choose the open cover that I want to construct a vector bundle. Um, and, and in order to forget about that choice, what you can do is you can take the colimit over all covers of your base space of this uh, check cohomology set and get what's usually called the check cohomology of B with coefficients in the orthogonal group. And now this map extends and is a bijection. So the conclusion of all of this is that vector bundles over B are in canonical bijection with these cocycles modulo these two um, kind of quotients, this one and this one. And, and really, if you want to be precise, this holds uh, you, you need some assumptions on B. For example, you just if, if you know that B is paracompact, then this is true. But for us, we are just going to focus on like nice uh, topological spaces. So we are we're not going to mention paracompactness all the time. OK, and now I'm going to give you the, the, the third way of, of describing a vector bundle, which is by classifying maps. So, sorry, before starting, let me tell you the idea of classifying maps in a picture. Um, the idea of classifying maps is the following. You have a vector bundle over V, so this is V. And the idea of a vector bundle, again, is that you have, uh, for every point in V, a vector space. And this is continuous in the sense that if you change, if you go from a point to another one, uh, the vector space is kind of varying continuously that the fiber is varying continuously. So if I want to be more, even more literal, I would like to see this vector bundle as a continuous function from B to some space of vector spaces. So I want each point in B to literally map to a point here that corresponds to a vector space. And I want in particular paths to map to continuous deformations of a vector space into another one. Um, and, and this would be like a classifying maps, a cl classifying space of vector spaces in the sense that a map from B to that would be the same thing as a vector, as a vector bundle. Um, so does this thing exist? The answer is yes. It's called a Grassmannian. <clears throat> so let me introduce that now. So um, we start by defining the Grassmannian of d-dimensional subspaces of R to the n. So this is just uh, the usual uh, vector space, and we consider all the dimensional subspaces of it. Um, and so here we have a set. This is the set of all the dimensional subspaces of R to the N. And if we want to make it a topological space, well, we have to give it a topology. And a cheap way of doing that is to first give it a metric and then use the, the induced topology. So the metric that we are going to give it is the Frobenius metric. And in order to do that, we're going to start by including the Grassmannian into uh, this Euclidean space uh, by of, of this Euclidean space of matrices by identifying a subspace of R to the n with the orthogonal projection onto it. So any subspace for any subspace there is a matrix that what it does is orthogonally project onto that subspace, and it's precisely one matrix that does that that does that orthogonally. Um, 
So there, there is a bijection between subspaces of R to the N and these projection matrices. And if you take the projection matrices of rank D, then you get precisely a correspondence between the D dimensional subspaces and the matrices, the projection matrices of dimension D. Um, so that's how you see these as a, as a subset of these. And so now we are going to topologize these. And here we just give you the, the usual topology. But in the future, for us, it's going to be important to, to, to have a metric, actually. So we are going to use the, the, the Frobenius norm here. I, if you never heard about the Frobenius norm, that's just the Euclidean norm. If you see this as a Euclidean space, the Frobenius norm is exactly the Euclidean norm. It's just called different because you're seeing it as a space of matrices instead of a, a space of vectors. Um, OK, so you get a, a topology here. In particular, you get a topology here. That's the Grassmannian DN. And that doesn't exactly do the job that we wanted. In order for it to do that, you have to, uh, you have to kind of forget about this N. And you do that by taking an increasing union of all of the Grassmannians. So if you have uh, the ideas that R N embeds in R N plus one, and that tells you that in particular, you can include the Grassmannian dn into the Grassmannian dn plus one. Um, and then you can just take the, like the co-limit of these topological spaces and you get a topological space called the, the Grassmannian of d dimensional planes, for example. Um, OK, and now let's see that this does exactly what we wanted. So given a co-cycle, there is a construction here. Um, if you never saw this construction, don't worry about it. It's the, the only point in, in having this here is to show you that there is a formula that is not super complicated, that given a co-cycle gets you a map from B to the Grassmannian. Um, and, and here you have to throw in a partition of unity that's not um, that's not super important. Uh, the only point is that, again, given a co-cycle, you can get a map from B to the Grassmannian, a continuous map from B to the Grassmannian. And if you, if you uh, take this further, you realize the following. So we saw that co-cycles are not the same as vector bundles. In order to make them the same, you have to take these uh, two quotients and get the, the Checo homology set. Um, and then if you... If you have uh, continuous maps from B to the Grassmannian, you can uh, kind of quotient this by the by being homotopic and get um, continuous maps up to homotopy. And now you can check that this map extends and becomes a bijection. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, those phi j's, sub phi sub j's, are uh, partitions of unity, right? Right. And you mentioned that you not necessarily consider your space to be paracompact, okay? No, no, I, I, I meant to say that we are always going to assume that B is paracompact. Oh, they are always paracompact, right? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay, okay, I see, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, if, if I didn't, didn't make that uh, clear, I'm, I'm going to assume that B is as nice as I want, but I think for everything that I'm going to discuss, B being paracompact para is enough. And at a small point, uh, is, T, is, the, is it a transpose of the matrix? The yeah, this is transpose. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this formula, uh, like, you have to be a bit precise as, like, what is J ranging on? And so, like, that if, if I were to write everything precisely, it would be a, a much bigger formula. So the whole point of having this here is that there's a formula that just involves matrices and a partition of unity. And the matrices come from the co-cycle that, that lets you land on the Grassmannian. That's all I want to like, uh, kind of say by having this here. So, um, so again, the, the conclusion of, of all of this now is that we knew that vector bundles are the same thing as co-cycles, as check co-cycles up to these equivalence relations. And now we know that they are also the same as having a map from B to the Grassmannian up to homotopy. And, and knowing, all, knowing these different presentations is going to be, it's very useful in, in, in all kinds of applications. Um, like many times you want to describe a vector bundle using a co-cycle because that's very explicit. But many times you want to use that there is a classifying map 
to uh, do like some theoretical construction. And that's what an example of that is, is what comes now. So characteristic classes are very easily defined um, using classifying maps. So the construction goes as follows. Suppose that you have a vector bundle over V. So this is a continuous function whose fibers are d-dimensional Euclidean spaces that vary continuously. I have a vector bundle over V. I can go here, see the vector bundle as a classifying map and get a classifying map for it. And the classifying map is really a, a continuous map up to homotopy, but let's just take a representative for now. Now, suppose that you have some ring, any ring that you want, and that you have an element in the cohomology of the Grassmannian with uh, coefficients in that ring. It, the, the ring doesn't really matter. You can choose whatever you want. So you have a, an element in the cohomology of the Grassmannian. You, can, you have this classifying map that is a map from B to the Grassmannian. So you can use it to pull back this class and get a cohomology class in, on the base, on the base B or in the cohomology of the base. If you fix F and you pull back all these classes, all the elements in the cohomology of the Grassmannian, all the things that you get are called characteristic classes. And those are invariants of the vector bundle F. So here we fixed F, we take its classifying map, we use it to pull back all the classes that we want from the cohomology of the Grassmannian. We get classes in the cohomology of the base. Those are called characteristic classes. And the point is that they are characteristic classes of the vector bundle F. And if you had two isomorphic vector bundles, you would get exactly the same classes up to equality. They would be exactly the same classes. So in particular, these classes let you, for example, distinguish between different vector bundles. Because if two vector bundles have different characteristic classes, then they cannot be isomorphic. So characteristic classes are invariants of vector bundles, isomorphism invariants. And the ones we're going to be interested in are the following two. We have the, the, the Stiefel-Whitney classes. There are um, infinitely many of those. So the, the i-th Stiefel-Whitney class is, um, it takes a vector bundle that now I'm seeing as a co-cycle and returns an element in the i-th cohomology group of B, of the base, with coefficients in Z mod 2. So for each i, you have one of these. Um, if i is bigger than d, you always get zero, but I mean, you can still define it. So Stiefel Whitney classes are uh, some, like they live in the, like the, the universal ones live in the, in the cohomology of the Grassmannian. Um, but if you do this, this pullback process, you can think of the Stiefel Whitney classes as a map that take a vector bundle and return an element in the cohomology of B with coefficients in Z mod two. And then the other one that is going to be relevant for us is the Euler class. And the Euler class is only defined for oriented vector bundles. And you can see that everything that I said before makes sense for oriented vector bundles if you replace the orthogonal group by the special orthogonal group. So, <clears throat> um, so the only conclusion here is that there is a, a class, uh, a characteristic class called the Euler class that takes an oriented vector bundle of uh, rank D and returns an element in the D cohomology of B now with coefficients in Z. Okay, so these are two examples of characteristic classes. Let me just very briefly mention, mention uh, two applications of characteristic classes that are really like the, the most basic applications that you can think of. The first one is that, um, so yeah, here characteristic classes provide obstructions to interesting problems. For example, if you have a vector bundle and you compute any characteristic class and you get something that is non-zero, you get an element in the cohomology that is non-zero, then F cannot be trivial, cannot be a trivial vector bundle. It cannot be the product of the base and the fiber. It has to be at, at the very least a bit more complicated than that. And the other example that I want to mention is that the first Stiefel Whitney class exactly tells apart orientable vector bundles from non orientable ones. So the first Stiefel Whitney class is zero precisely when the vector bundle is orientable. And then there are many other applications. For example, 
um, if the Euler class is non-zero, then you know that there cannot exist a nowhere vanishing section. And th this is perhaps one of the reasons uh, uh, people started studying uh, characteristic classes. You can use the characteristic classes to get obstructions to embedding a manifold in Rn. And, and that's like a pretty important problem. Like, can I take this manifold and embed it in Rn with a very small n? And, and you can use the Stiefel Whitney classes to find obstructions that tell you that you can't in some cases. Okay, so that's, that's all about uh, the classical picture. So, um, I mean, if there are any questions or obs observations, we can stop for a second, and otherwise we can start with the applications. Okay, so vector bundles in applications. In order to describe this, or like the pipeline that I'm going to be kind of using, I have to first tell you a little bit about topological persistence. Um, and, and yeah, this is like a very simplified picture. So the idea of topological persistence is the following, or at least the, the part that I want to highlight is the following. Suppose that, that you have a point cloud, which you can either uh, understand as a, just a subset of some Euclidean space, um, or more generally as a finite metric space. So you just have some, some points and you have distances between those. And you want to use topology to, to study that. And the idea is that if you have something that looks like a circle or something that looks like a sphere um, or, or even something that looks like a disjoint union of stuff, this is very important for clustering, for example, um, you kind of want to realize that. You want to sort of build a, a topological space whose topology is the one that you, that you are sort of seeing when you see the point cloud. Uh, the only thing is that when n is large, you don't see the point cloud and you still want to, to kind of extract some topology from it. And, and you want to study the multi-scale topology. <clears throat> and what does that mean? Well, let me, let me show you an example. So we're, gonna, we're going to, to use the Vietoris Rips complex to study this multi-scale topology of a point cloud. And the Vietoris Rips complex of a finite metric space is going to be a functor from the real uh, <clears throat> deposit of real numbers to simplicial complexes. And if you want to think about topological spaces, that's the same for this application. And here's the definition, but, but it's going to be much easier to just look at, at a picture. So suppose that this is your point cloud. So this is a subset, a finite subset. This is a finite subset of the Euclidean plane. And if you look at it, it sort of looks like two circles. Um, but the kind of the scale of the circles is different. These, cir these points are pretty, uh, like pretty close. The points in this circle are pretty close. And the points in this circle are further away. So if you, the idea is that if you, look it, if you look at it at a single distance scale, you're not going to be able to see the two circles. There's a distance scale for which you can see one circle and a distance scale for which you see the other circle. So a bit more precisely, you can take this point cloud and construct its Vietoris Rips complex that is going to be an increasing union of simplicial complexes. At zero, you're just going to have the points of your point cloud as vertices of your simplicial complex. So topologically, it's just going to be discrete. Now, as epsilon, as, as this parameter uh, delta goes lar uh, grows larger, uh, you're going to start adding more and more simplices. And you, here at delta zero, you're going to add simplices. You're going to add one simplices whenever you have a pair of points that are at distance at most delta zero. And, and the higher simplices, you're just going to have a, a, an n simplex whenever all the, all the points, are, the, the, like the, um, the diameter of that subset is at most delta. So uh, here at delta zero, in this example, I just added uh, one simplicis between these two things, and now I see a circle. So, um, I mean, this is starting to work because uh, here I, I like I kind of saw a circle, but now I have a simplicial complex whose homotopy type is the one of the circle. So I, I did get the circle. As delta gets uh, larger, 
Now, um, many simplices are going to start appearing here, and this is going to become a contractible subcomplex. And I'm drawing this as like this. So when, when delta gets large enough and all these things get connected, I get like a, a full simplex here, and, and this becomes contractible. So I stop seeing the circle there. Uh, but now some things here start joining. So maybe these points were closer than other points, so they start joining. And at some point, I get this, this circle here um, of edges, and, and this part is now contractible. So now I see it, this, the other circle. So this is like this is the multi-scale uh, thing that I was talking about. For some deltas, I see this circle, and for other deltas, I see the other circle. And then when delta uh, goes uh, grows large enough, I just get a contractible thing, and and the topology stops being interesting. So Vitoris rips starts uh, by being discrete and ends up being uh, contractible. Okay, so how do people study these things? Well, there, there are many things that you can do once you have a persistent topological space. So a topological space that is kind of filtered or varies in time. And um, some, a specific thing that people do is compute the homology of this. And the nice thing about the homology of persistent topological spaces is that it can be represented as a very combinatorial, in a very combinatorial way. And that's, um, that's the representation as barcodes. So here, I, I think of this as a functor from R to topological spaces. And now I, this is a functor, so I can compose it with a homology functor. And now I get a functor from R to vector spaces. Uh, and this is the first homology. And here I'm taking coefficients in, in any field that you want. Um, this is called the barcode of this, of this um, persistent vector space. And it exactly captures the isomorphism type of that vector space. So the vector space here has dimension zero. Um, I mean, it's just a vector space zero because the H, H1 has dimension zero. Now here, I have a circle. So the dimension starts being one. But I'm not only recording the dimension. I'm recording the fact that there is a generator here that maps to the generator in the in the in the next uh, deltas until this get, this gets filled in and the generator dies and now i have dimension 0 again and then i reach this delta 2 and i get a a, a new generator uh, that maps to generators maps to generator and then at some point everything gets filled in and i get dimension 0 again so this this barcode represents precisely captures all there is about this uh, functor. And uh, finally, uh, a more compact representation of barcodes is that of persistence diagram. So this is a persistence diagram that has exactly the same information as the barcode. These two things are interchangeable. Uh, but instead of having these lines that like I have to like kind of draw in 2D, um, I, I just, well, people, what, what they do is they just draw this square. Um, where you have exactly one point for each bar. So here there are two bars, so I have two points. And the coordinates of the points are just the, the birth and the death of each bar. So this nice little picture captures the isomorphism type of, um, of this persistent vector space. OK. So that's that's all I'm gonna say about uh, topological persistence. Um, well, okay, maybe let me just say one more thing. The fact that I see two things here tells me that there are in, the data has in some sense two holes, but the two holes don't happen at the same time. So here I cannot compare these two holes because they happen at different scales. They they don't share any scale, and and I can see that in the diagram, and that's that's useful. Okay, so let's let's go to applications of of um, vector bundles. So suppose that I'm in the following situation: I have a dynamical system, and I want to study the dynamical system by studying the attractors of the dynamical system. So let me define a few terms. For us, a dynamical system is just going to consist of a phase space, which is the 
the space that parameterizes all possible states of a single particle in that dynamical system. Um, and then I have to have the dynamics and the dynamics are gonna be given basically by an action of the real line on the space that basically take a T and a particle at some spot to um, kind of the action by T that take the particle further in time. So the idea of, of this action is that I let, uh, I have the, the phase space and I have a particle and then I act by some time T and the particle is now maybe somewhere else. Um, okay, that's what a dynamical system is for us. This is uh, an oversimplification, but it is enough for this example. Um, now an attractor of a dynamical system is uh, an invariant set of the phase space. So meaning a, a subset of the phase space such that when you act by the dynamical system, you always fall inside this set again. So there is, it is a subset that is invariant in the sense that whenever you take something there and you act by the linear system, by the dynamical system, uh, you always fall inside that set again. That is attracting. So it has to have some attracting uh, property. And informally, what that property uh, is, is that if you have something that is sufficiently close to it, then as time acts, it gets closer and closer to the, to the attractor. So attra an attractor is an invariant set that has this attracting property that attracts particles. And, and, and this is kind of an observed phenomenon. Lots of dynamical systems have pretty interesting attractors. So um, we want to study a dynamical system by study the top, studying the topology of its attractors. And in particular, given uh, an element, a point in, in, its, in the phase space of the dynamical system, we want to recover the geometry of the attractor this point this specific point is converging to we kind of let the, the dynamical system act this point is getting closer and closer to some attractor and we want to understand the topology of that attractor okay so how do we do this in practice there's the following recipe you you have your point and you let the system act uh, some finite amount of times so you choose some interval delta t if you want, and you let the system act, for example, here n times, and you get this kind of sequence of points in the phase space. And the idea is that these points are getting closer and closer to the attractor. Okay, now, usually in practice, you don't have uh, access to the whole phase space. Maybe you don't even know what the phase space is. Usually, the only thing that you have access to is some function, some function that you can measure so some, some property of the particle that you can measure, for example, I don't know, the pressure that is imparted on it or its velocity or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so you have this function that is defined on the phase space that for any point in the phase space returns a real number. And instead of having access to this sequence of, of elements in the phase space, you only have access to this time series that is just a sequence of, of real numbers. that is your sequence of measurements. And you want to use that to study the topology of M. So there's, there's something called the delay embedding that given any time series gives you back a point cloud. And if you never saw this, don't worry too much. It is, it is quite a simple formula, but uh, I, didn't have, I, I don't have a drawing for it. So let's, let's just assume that there is such a recipe <clears throat> that given a time series, a real value time series, it returns a point cloud. Um, and then there's this kind of amazing theorem by Takens that if you interpret correctly, tells you that uh, under my hypothesis uh, on, the, on the dynamical system, you know that this uh, point cloud is gonna be concentrated around a diffeomorphic copy of the attractor it is converging to. So uh, you, you took your, your particle, you let the system act, you get this, uh, and then you, you do these measurements, you get this um, time series. Now you do this delay embedding thing, you get a point cloud, so finite uh, amount of points in uh, Euclidean space. And if things are sufficiently good, then uh, the attractor the particle is converging to is a, is a differentiable manifold and this point cloud is concentrated around the manifold. 
Um, so, so now we, we see how we can start trying to use uh, persistence to understand the topology of the attractor. I have a question. So the P space and the RN, are they the same in this, in this case? No. So, because so P, M was a subspace of P a priori, right? Right, right. So that's why I'm saying a diffeomorphic copy of M. And how P and RN are related in, in this case? Or what's the relationship between? So P the theorem, R? one of the hypotheses of the theorem is that, uh, that M is differentiable and that its dimension is less than uh, n divided by two. So this, this n here comes from the delay embedding. This is a choice that you have to make when you do, when you construct the delay embedding. Uh, what is tau there? Uh, this is, so the, may, maybe, let me be a bit more precise. In order to do the delay embedding, you choose two things. You choose tau and n. These are parameters that you have to choose looking at your time series. And the idea is that you have your time series a sequence of measurements. And now you want to construct a point cloud. So what you can do is um, take, um, so you want to construct a point cloud, you have to construct a, like a, a set of vectors. You can construct a vector by choosing, for example, the first measurement of the time series, and then the third one, and then the fifth one, and then the seventh one, okay? You choose these, these four things, for example. This gets you a vector in R4. Then you can do the same thing with the second one, with the uh, fourth one, etc. You do the four of those, and you get another element of our of our four. And you do that for each for each starting point. Um, so here tau is two, because I I started with this one, and then instead of taking this one, I took the the third one, and then the fifth one. So here tau, tau is two, and n is uh, I, I took four things, so n is four. Uh, so this delay embedding is kind of taking like this, uh, I don't know exactly how to describe it in, uh, in, a, few, in a few words. I should have a picture here, but. Yeah, I, I think this already helps, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but you have no idea what the P space is and the M space is to start with, right? Right, right. That's the whole point. You don't know how P looks like, but you still want to recover the topology of M. And the theorem tells you, even if you don't know anything about P, in good cases, this point cloud is going to be concentrated around a diffeomorphic copy of M. So you don't have access to the real M, but for topological purposes, you have a copy of it embedded in Rn. So that's enough. Um, it's, it's kind of a magical theorem. Um, so, okay. Um, so there's this recipe. Let me let me show you how you can how this happens, like how this looks in practice. So suppose that you have this dynamical system. It's called the double gyre, and it consists of two vortices that are rotating. I mean, the, the vector fields are like rotating, and um, and this is going to be a time variant dynamical system. So not only I have the, the vortices that make the particles turn, the vortices are going to be moving left to right periodically. So let me show you how that looks like. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this, is, this is two particles in that dynamical system uh, that are moving because of the vector field. And here I want to point out this, this thing that the two, um, the two vortices are uh, oscillating left to right. So hopefully you can see that. I don't know how many frames per second you're getting, but yeah, hopefully you can see that this, these two vortices are oscillating left to right. Okay. And here I put two particles in it at some time zero. And uh, we see that the, like the, the blue particle is doing something quite um, kind of regular. It's basically just going in circles, although the circles are moving a little bit. Uh, the, the red one is doing something weirder where it kind of goes further from the center and then it goes closer to the center and then further. So the, the red one is doing something a bit weirder than the blue one. 
So, and, and we want to, what we want to do is to study the topology of the attractors of these two particles. So, um, first thing that we notice is that although in, in, in a practical application, we may not have access to the phase space, um, in this case, we do have access to the phase space and the phase space is not just this rectangle. The phase space, since this dynamical system is changing in time, the, tra the trajectory of a particle doesn't only depend on when the, or, or of, on when uh, or on where the particle is, it depends on when, at what time that particle is there, because this dynamical system is changing in time. So if you have a particle here, and if you don't know at what time it is there, you don't know the, the tra trajectory. So the phase space is going to be this rectangle times S1, because this thing is changing periodically. So in order to know the, the trajectory, you have to know where it is and at what time it is there. Okay, so we want to understand the attractors of the blue ball and the red ball. And if you do the Taken's embedding thing, the delay embedding thing, you, well, you're gonna get something in, in some high dimensional space because of this R and R big N. Um, but in this case, you can project it in a sufficiently nice way to R2 and get these two pictures. And this corresponds to the blue ball and this corresponds to red ball. So this is, according to Taken's theorem, this should be very similar to the attractor the blue ball is converging to, and this should be very similar to the attractor the red ball is converging to. So this looks like a band, like a, like a cylinder, whereas this, if you, if you look at it very closely, you're gonna realize that as you, go, as you do this thing, this kind of two-dimensional thing is changing orientation. So this really looks like a Mobius band. Um, but if you apply persistent homology to it, you're not gonna see that. So this, these are the persistence diagrams of these two, of applying Vitoris strips to these, to these spaces. Here, the persistence diagram, I'm computing H0, H1, and H2. H0 is not really telling me anything because this is basically connect, connects, uh, connected. Um, H1 is telling me something interesting. H1 has a very persistent class, and that's telling me there's basically just one hole, and that's it. And H2 doesn't really tell me anything. In this case, H1, well, H2 and H0 don't really tell me much because there are not very persistent classes there, but H1 has two persistent classes. Now, uh, as happened in the previous example, these classes are happening at very different uh, distance scales. And uh, if you look at it closely, what's happening is that this class appears not because of the intrinsic topology, but because of how this is embedded. So this embedding of the Mobius band is kind of wrapped around itself. And that makes, makes it so that when you look at it kind of from further away, you, you see two holes. So this persistence class is really due to the embedding. And this one that happens at a smaller distance scale is really due to the intrinsic topology. So all of this is to say that if you only care about the intrinsic topology, you should be looking at small distance scales. And at small distance scales, these two things look like the same thing. So the top, just the, like the, the homology of it is not gonna distinguish these two spaces. And that's clear. If you want to distinguish a Mobius band from a, from a cylinder, you can't using the homology. Um, but, but topologically, they are different topological spaces. Uh, in fact, they are, they are uh, like differentiable uh, manifolds. So you should be able to distinguish them using the tangent bundle. So how does, um, how does the tangent bundle look in practice? Um, so sorry, do, how, how, how much long do you have? Do you have? Um, you're muted. She can't, you're muted, I cannot hear you. Okay, sorry, uh, I think we started at 3.35 or 3.40. So, I mean, you, we usually go full at hour, that's that's fine, don't, don't worry about the time too much, so. Okay, okay. So, 
how does um, how can we estimate the tangent bundle? So again, we, we saw these two shapes that we cannot distinguish using homology, but they are very simple shapes and we want to be able to distinguish these. And, and like the, the differential topology is different. So how, how can we estimate the, the tangent bundle? Um, so there's something called PCA, which is, uh, stands for uh, principal component analysis that what it does is given a point cloud, it finds the, the linear subspace that approximates it the best. And local PCA is a version of that where instead of trying to approximate the whole uh, point cloud by a linear subspace, you do that for small pieces. So you can kind of start to see why you may want to use this to approximate a tangent bundle because locally a tangent bundle should be like a linear subspace, but globally, it shouldn't necessarily. So suppose that you have a point cloud, what you can do is basically cover it by small opens or rather by small just uh, kind of uh, sub, uh, sub uh, point clouds and now apply PCA to each of these. So you can apply PCA and get an approximation of this small point cloud by a linear subspace and an approximation of some other small point cloud by another linear subspace. Now, if you look at these linear subspaces of, as abstract linear subspaces of, in this case, R2, you can choose orthonormal basis, basis for it, uh, which is what we are doing here. This is just a basis for the what I'm thinking of as the tangent space of Y, and this is a basis for the tangent space of X. Um, and now you can use these orthonormal, orthonormal uh, matrices to project from one subspace to the other one. This is uh, a projection matrix. Um, and I can, I can, um, um, I can approximate this projection matrix by an orthogonal matrix. So I can find the orthogonal matrix that is closest to this projection matrix in the Frobenius metric, for example. So here, what I'm trying to get at is the following. So in, in this example, this, this orthogonal matrix is, is minus one. Uh, can I have a question? So you see the orthogonal matrices and the projector operators inside the larger ambient space. And what is that space? Is it like the matrices, space of matrices? Um, so are you thinking of both of these as subspaces of uh, D by D matrices? Because you mentioned the projector on the other side, right? Right, right. So, so um, I mean, if you, if you, if this is a, an orthonormal basis, you just put it as columns of a matrix mm -hmm. uh, that is going to have th uh, D columns and uh, N rows. And if you do this uh, operation, you're just taking one matrix times the other one, and that gets you a D by D matrix that you should think of as taking vectors in this um sorry in in this vector space and projecting them to this vector space okay okay so so by by the distance you mean this frobenius distance inside the matrix uh, d by d matrices yes space yes. of d by d matrix okay yeah so i got a d by d matrix and now uh, i want to approximate it by a, an orthogonal matrix and i do that using the frobenius metric I, I i just find the closest one and that's something that you can do computationally mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so you do that. And the point now is the following. Suppose that you have three points now. You have X, Y, and some Z. Maybe Z is this one. Um, and you do the same thing for Z. If X, Y, and Z are sufficiently close, then you expect the following to happen. If you change from this tangent space to this one, and then from this one to the one of Z, that should be very similar to going from the one at Y directly to the one at Z. So if, if you compose the projection from, y, from the tangent at Y to the tangent at X with the projection from the tangent at X to the tangent at Z, that should be very similar to, compose, uh, to directly going from the tangent at Y to the tangent at Z. And that, this starts looking very cosaically. It starts looking like a cosaical condition. 
So a bit more, if you choose some small enough delta, uh, you can think of this, uh, of this collection of matrices as an approximate cocycle on the Vietori strips of X. So you have the Vietori strips of X that has as points the points in, um, in your data set. And if, this, if these points are sufficiently close, then you expect uh, these matrices that you constructed to satisfy an approximate cocycle condition in the sense that if you do this matrix times this matrix, that's very similar to this matrix. Okay, so that's how you, and, and the idea here is that we are trying to approximate the cocycle that defines the tangent bundle of X. And hopefully from that cocycle, we can extract something interesting. Um, and in since, uh, I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to skip the second example. And maybe in the end, we can go back to it if there's time. So this is a, another example in which <clears throat> the whole point is that you end up getting uh, something like an approximate cocycle. So over a simplicial complex again. So now what we want to do is to make sense out of these approximate cocycles. We want to like kind of describe a mathematical notion of approximate cocycle uh, that makes sense and that has some connection to a real vector bundle, a true vector bundle. So let, let's be precise now. Suppose that you have a simplicial complex, a discrete epsilon approximate cocycle is going to consist of the following. This is going to be a, a discrete epsilon approximate cocycle over K. It's going to consist of, of this uh, family of matrices. You're going to have one matrix for each edge of K every time you have an edge in K. You're going to have a matrix. Um, these matrices, the, the matrix that you have for the edge going uh, forwards is going to be the, the inverse of the matrix that you have for the edge going backwards. That's, um, I mean, that's just a, a minor detail. And it's going to satisfy this approximate cocycle condition. So whenever you have a triangle in K, a two simplex, you want that this multiplication uh, minus this multiplication, the norm of that, the Frobenius norm, is smaller than epsilon. So a discrete epsilon approximate cocycle is something really, really simple. It's just a collection of matrices, one for each edge, one simplex of your simplicial complex, such that every time that you have a triangle, uh, the, like the, the difference between going through one, uh, like a composite of two edges of the triangle and the other edge is smaller than epsilon. And, and you have discrete epsilon approximate cocycles for, a, for each epsilon. Okay, and that's exactly what we found in the application. We found something that, yeah, that is described as like this. Now, um, if we if we denote epsilon approximate cocycles by by this discrete, this D stands for discrete uh, over a simplicial complex with values in the orthogonal group, you can again take a, a quotient by change of basis essentially, and get the discrete uh, check cohomology set of K with values in the orthogonal group. Um, okay, so you can do that. And the, the important thing here is that that is going to be important in the, in, in, uh, in the approximate case is that this has a metric. This comes with a metric that comes from the Frobenius norm. So this epsilon approximate um, cohomology set also is not just a set, it's, just, it's also a metric space. Okay. So let me give you a lemma before stating one of the main theorems. Uh, this lemma is due by, uh, to Tina Rush, and it says that if you if you have the Grassmannian and you see it inside R to the infinity times infinity, um, you can you can take this this Grassmannian and thicken it by square root of two divided by two, and what that means is you take each point of the Grassmannian and put a ball of radius square root of two divided by two. So you get a what's called a thickening usually. So this, this space includes in this space canonically. Um, since this is sufficiently small and this is a nice space, this retracts. So these two things are homotopy equivalent. Um, 
Okay, so that's what the lemma says. If you take the Rasmanian and you thicken it a little bit, and here we're using the Frobenius metric, then you can retract it. So now the first main theorem says the following. The classical map that we had in the beginning that takes a cocycle to a classifying map, you can extend it to approximate cocycles. If you have an approximate cocycle, you don't get a map from K to the Grassmannian because the cocycle doesn't satisfy the exact cocycle condition, but you can go to the Grassmannian that is slightly thickened. And this thickening happens linearly in epsilon. Uh, so basically, the fact that you didn't have the exact cocycle condition doesn't let you land exactly in the Grassmannian, but you can land in a, in a small thickening of the Grassmannian. In particular, if epsilon is smaller than one half, you can retract this Grassmannian to the true Grassmannian, and you can get a vector bundle. So if you have an approximate cocycle that is sufficiently exact, so it is approximate, by, but epsilon is smaller than one half, then you can assign a true vector bundle to it. And uh, not only that, this construction is useful because first of all, it is stable. And what stability means is that if you started with two approximate cocycles that were close in this metric, then the vector bundle that you get is the same. And that's important in applications because you, you don't have control over how exact your data is. If, if you perturb your, your data a little bit, the true vector bundle that we are constructing in this theorem is the same one. Um, and this is more of a comment. Uh, you can use this theorem to show that if you have a, a simplicial complex, uh, you can represent any vector bundle by a discrete approximate cycle, as long as you let me subdivide the, the simplicial complex some, some number of times. So, so what this means is that in practice, you can get any vector bundle using this theorem. You're not restricted to some special kind of vector bundles. Um, okay, so so fine. At least if if you have a cos uh, something that that is like a cycle but is approximate in an application, if you can make it so that it is sufficiently exact, then you know that there is some underlying vector bundle. But now the question is, can you do can you compute anything about this vector bundle? And uh, the answer is that you can at the very least compute some low dimensional characteristic classes. So. Um, we have algorithms that, given a discrete approximate uh, cocycle over a simplicial complex uh, for which epsilon is smaller than two, return uh, an element in the cohomology of k with coefficients in z mod two. Um, and then two other algorithms. So this one kind of looks like the first default Whitney class, and I'm going to make precise in what sense is the, the, the first stiffel winnie class in a second. Um, and then you have one for the second stiffel winnie class and one for the Euler class, as long as your vector bundle has rank two. So these are, these are all uh, low dimensional in the sense that you're landing in cohomologies of uh, dimension one and two. Um, and these are actual algorithms. Like we have an implementation in which you give it a simplicial complex, finite simplicial complex, and you give it this family of matrices, and it does something, and it returns a cocycle representing a class in the cohomology of your simplicial complex. And these algorithms uh, not only exist, but they are computing something familiar. First of all, they are stable. So if you start with something with a cocycle which is slightly different, you get the same cohomology class, and that's important for applications. And they are also consistent in the sense that if epsilon is sufficiently small, then this algorithm is, co is uh, computing the first Stiefel Whitney class of this vector bundle, of the one that this theorem gives you. And again, if this epsilon is sufficiently small, then this algorithm is computing the second Stiefel Whitney class of the true vector bundle that we defined be, uh, before, and the same one for this one. The same thing for that one. Um, so, and, and these algorithms are practical in the sense that they are polynomial in the number of vertices of uh, K. And this one is actually also polynomial in V, 
whereas this one is exponential in D. So this one really works for V being small. Um, okay. Um, so let's let's see one of these algorithms in action to see that you can actually do something with them. Uh, sorry, Luis, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. What was K here? I, I thought we were starting from a point cloud, right? When we defined a discrete vector space, or am I confusing myself? How did right, K, so, K appear? Well, for for a discrete vector, a discrete uh, approximate cocycle is defined for any um, any simplicial complex. Okay. How you got how you got the simplicial complex is, uh, I mean, this theorem is not asking you how did you get the simplicial complex. You oh. just have a simplicial complex. But if you and okay, one way to construct the simplicial complex is to use, for example, Aviatoris Rips complex. But the, is K embedded inside an Euclidean space? No, no. So here you just have a, an abstract simplicial complex. You have an abstract simplicial complex with some collection of matrices. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. So they are already given. Yeah. Okay. And one way to construct it is to do this local PCA. Okay. Uh, now I see. Okay. Okay. Construction. Yeah. Okay. So I was confused. Thank no, you. no. That, that's. Thank you for the question. Um, So yeah, and, and this theorem is also in, in a sense abstract because given just a discrete approximate cocycle, uh, if the cocycle is sufficiently exact, it does something and returns a cohomology uh, class uh, in the in the cohomology of the simplicial complex. Okay, so let's let's see an example. So we wanted to distinguish these two things, and I said at one point that the first Stiefel Whitney class of a vector bundle precisely tells you if the vector bundle is orientable or not. So we should be able to use this first Stiefel Whitney class algorithm to distinguish these things. And and what we do is what we what we outlined before. So you apply local PCA. So this is a point cloud. This really, in reality, this is embedded in R5. And this one too. So you apply local PCA to it, the, the thing that I had be outlined before, and you get a discrete approximate cocycle over the Vietoris rips of this. So you do the Vietoris rips of this. And doing local PCA, you get a discrete approximate cocycle on it. Now, uh, this is just a, a detail. You have to choose a parameter for Vitoris Rips. And here, basically, so Vitoris Rips keeps adding more and more edges and simplices. You add the biggest parameter so that this cocycle is still a two approximate cocycle. And that's so that you can apply the algorithms that we have. Uh, so you basically you take the largest simplicial complex built on your data that for which the cocycle that local PCA gives you is uh, too approximate. These are mainly just details. And now you apply the algorithm, you get a cohomology class in, uh, in the in the uh, in the Vitoris rips in the cohomology of Vitoris rips with coefficients in Z mod two, and you write this class in uh, the basis that is given by these persistence, persistent classes. So these, these classes are, are elements in the cohomology that are generators. So you can write any class in that basis. And this is what we did here. So in this case, when you do this computation, you actually just get zero. You get the zero element in the cohomology of iterative strips. Um, so what that's telling you is that local PCA that is approximating little pieces by planes, as you go around this circle, local PCA is not changing orientation. Uh, but when you do the same computations here and you write this first Stiefel Whitney class in, in this, in the basis given by the persistent uh, classes, you, you get that, that this Stiefel Whitney class is the sum of this class plus some other classes here. Um, and in particular, what that's telling you is that since this class basically represents this big hole, that hole, what that's telling you is that local PCA, as you go around this band, changes the orientation. When you return here, you you like the orientation is is the opposite one. Um, and so this is this is really if you if you looked at at persistence diagrams before. 
I'm sh shading this this region that is the region that can contain um, things that sum to this. And this is just to make sure that we are not cheating. We we are allowing this class to be non to appear in the in the decomposition of this class, but it just doesn't appear. So so we we are sure that. Um, that uh, we are letting local PCA change orientation, it's just not changing orientation. Whereas here it is changing orientation. Um, okay, so this is all there is to this example. And I don't know, maybe maybe it's uh, that's enough time. I, I'm not sure if, if someone wants to see that example or if it's better to have questions. Okay, maybe maybe we can pause here to to ask uh, if there are any questions from from the audience. And also, by the way, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. It was really really interesting. So, do you have any any questions for for Luis?